The Friday crew is intact. However, we have gone to the bench for a couple of uh, substitutions, <laughs> one of whom wants to make a very clear distinction on his political positions <laughs> <laughs> compared to the person he is replacing. So let's start via telephone with Joe. Joey Torts for ready. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning, everybody. Also in studio, Delegate Mike Kite returns. Good morning, Robert. The senior member of our Friday crew, Attorney at Law Michael Carl. Good morning. Senate President Craig Blair, who would like to distinguish himself from the person he's replacing, which would be uh, Bill Stubblefield. Would you like to mention your political positions? <laughs> I think y'all doing more talk than I am. Good morning. Also in the Larry Schultz chair, it's uh, former delegate John Doyle. Good morning, Mr. Doyle. Good morning, everybody. And what started this was I just observed that, that Craig Blair replacing Bill Stubblefield shifted the balance of the of the collective panel a tad to the right, and, and Craig took umbrage to that. I think he would rather th that I say it shifted it far to the right. So because Craig is my friend, it is far to the right. So, so in, in your word, John, in your world, how far is a tad exactly as a measurement, as a measurement uh, stick? It's inexact. Because <laughs> if, if I'm looking at Bill and Craig and I'm looking at the shift further right, it's a little more than a tad. As, as defined by the Webster's Dictionary of tads. I use the Oxford Dictionary, oh, not well, Webster's. That would, that would change things. So. Yes. Uh, by the way, Mr. Uh, Stubblefield's absence today uh, shifted the uh, introductions a little bit for this Halloween, as we uh, have a Halloween weekend coming up, right? <laughs> Halloween is not until next Tuesday, or this upcoming Tuesday. But nevertheless, we'll, we'll have missed it by the time next Friday comes along. So I have done Halloween introductions for all of you. And uh, with theme music in the background, I think it's quite appropriate, too. So uh, we begin introductions with Mr. Doyle. Oh, this, this is nice. Yeah, okay. I'm going to give some thriller background music for the intros, John. All right? It's just four days until we Halloween. Just four days until the ghosts are seen. There's been plenty to scare us already this year. Some that's in D.C. and some that is near. Why, in Jefferson County, you'll find one John Doyle. Well, he watches a county government that makes his blood boil. You want to watch something <laughs> scary? I give you a submission. Just sit back and observe the Jefferson County Commission. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me an intro. <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that one. <laughs> Mr. Carl, you're up next. I, I say that so that our producer uh, knows exactly where we're going. Uh, each Halloween season, he graces our show. The anti-Michelle Obama, you go high, he hits low. His low hits aren't reserved to those scary and blue. If you're a radical neocon isolationist, you'll get his wrath too. He presents his last issue with bias he's not hiding. As he asks his weekly question, who's the worst president ever, Joe Biden or Joe Biden? <laughs> well said. I thought you might like that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Michael Hyde, you're next. Like the Exorcist movie, he's back once again. Only his life ain't no sequel. It's an original 10. He's been in the service. He's been a real Sarge. He's an elected official. He's the printer in charge. He's got his own time. He's got his own fright. Just don't call him a rhino. He's Delegate Michael Height. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Joe, you're up next. Been oh quite. Boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Joe is always the most hesitant of our intros. From the receiving end. You, you provided the picture, Joe. We just got the mileage on it. Uh, yeah. And you're off the hook. The picture's retired now. Except, except when we transpose Gilstrap's face on it. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that show too late. Been quite the October for our next ghastly ghoul. On the show so often, he should be on the Hornby payroll. We put Joe for ready to work and to work quite a bit. He'd work a lot less if those grand juries were just once a quit. Each time there's an indictment, he calls into our show. And since this is Berkeley County, thank goodness it's pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, you're, Craig, you're the anchor like in the Bill Stubblefield chair. I had this grand Stubblefield intro, by the way. Almost, I'll save it for next Friday. All right. For Mr. Blair, uh, and I wrote this one on short notice. He made his living keeping you in water. Then he went to Charleston, and the temperature got hotter. He came in this morning planning for a brief interview. Then Bill Stubblefield called off, and now he's stuck here, too. 
You want to give yourself a good pre-Halloween scare? Well, I'm about to give you 90 more minutes of Senate President Craig Blair. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thriller. Huh? Whoa! <laughs> good ching. All right, very good. Uh, so, Joe, with uh, the introductions done, we now go to our leadoff hitter, Mr. Joe Joseph. Joey Torts for ready. Well done, Rob. I, I, on uh, short notice with Craig Blair there. Thank you. Uh, I looked at this uh, report from uh, the University of Virginia Center for Politics. And, and as we know, that's uh, Professor Larry Sabato's group. Uh, which has a uh, really a, a remarkable record for predicting races across the country. A lot of uh, they do a lot of analysis for swing district elections, and they do a lot of polling. and their And their polling is uh, is very much uh, considered to be state of the art. Recently, they did a poll of over two thousand citizens in this country, so a very large poll. And some of the results, frankly, are startling. Now, the one thing they establish is we're, we're a very polarized country, and we know that. Uh, uh, Seventy percent of Biden voters, 68 percent of Trump voters believe that electing the other guy would do lasting harm to the country. And about half of these voters believe electing the other guy would be a threat to our way of life. What is startling, what is really astounding to me in this poll is that <laughs> – a large percentage of this country is already ready to chuck our way of life, regardless of how the uh, election in 2024 comes out. And listen to some of these stats. Forty percent of both of these groups, the Biden voters and Trump voters, believe that the other side has become so extreme that it's acceptable to use violence to prevent, prevent the other side from achieving its goals. Forty-one percent of Trump supporters and 30 percent of Biden supporters agree that a red or blue state group should secede from the union. 31% of Trump supporters and 24% of Biden supporters somewhat agree that democracy is no longer a viable form of government. 50% of Trump voters and 32% of Biden voters believe that we need laws requiring our citizens to show respect for national symbols and leaders. And 37% of Trump voters and 24% of Biden voters want to restrict First Amendment rights if the expressions are unpatriotic or disloyal. And about two th- or one third of these voters want laws that further limit demonstrations and protests. These are First Amendment rights we're talking about here, folks. And in a time of crisis, almost a third of these voters, whether they're Trump supporters or Biden supporters, want elections in this country suspended. Now, look, I, I, like everybody in this room, I lived through the 60s and 70s, a time of great upheaval and violence and, and really dangerous political discourse. We got through that. And, you know, we came out on the other side in the 80s and 90s with, with a, a lot of tranquility in comparison. But I have to wonder if we're about to go through another period in this country of great upheaval. Uh, when you have roughly one-third to 40% of our electorate willing to basically step outside the bounds of the Constitution in, in, uh, in an effort to have their political side of the argument prevail. And I think that is a dangerous situation. I think this poll points out not more, more than just polarization, but I really – a sacrifice of the rights we hold dear. And I wonder if my concern is shared by others this morning. Uh, As Larry Sabato said in conclusion after this poll, we stand on the precipice of a developing emergency. The pervasive disregard for the fundamental freedoms contained in our Constitution poses a grave threat to our way of life. Is that sentiment shared by our group this morning? Good stuff, Joe, as always, as the leadoff hitter. Let's uh, go to Delegate Michael Hyde first on this one. Well, you know, I read through that uh, survey as well, and, and the thing that struck me more than anything else was the, the 
the fact that some wanted to do away with First Amendment rights or, or any rights that are, are given to us in our democracy and go to a more authoritarian type style of governor, I, that that is very disturbing that they believe, you know, their, whichever side, but they their side should have an authoritarian type government and and that the government itself should have more power over what individuals can do and can't do and and the to, to take away our rights it's it's almost like they haven't been educated they haven't seen um the the way the rest of the world works in in societies where there is this authoritarian type um government um and a lot of this comes from the educated, so it's very confusing to me and very disturbing. I I would have to agree with you, Joe. This is this is a very troubling survey. If that many people want to do away with with constitutional rights, I don't think people understand how our government works anymore. Um, and and if they do, they just don't care. They just want their way. So um, I would say, Joe, you're right. This was a very disturbing survey. Mr. Doyle, um, I think if Larry Sabato and his hotshot polling operation had been around in the 1850s, that is exactly what they would have found. I'm glad he's here because at least this time we've got some warning. Uh, and the country almost came apart in, in 1860, I think, be, because of, of attitudes like this about each other. Uh, and, and it probably snuck up on them because they didn't have polling. So, uh, I, uh, 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 yeah, we need to wake up. Mr. Blair. Well, I'm going to be a different perspective on this. And <clears throat> that is, is that, uh, go back to World War II. And we were a sleeping giant. And we were fighting amongst ourselves. And there was a huge fight amongst whether we should be involved in the World War or, 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 or not. And, and it was huge. It was a huge fight. But the fact of the matter is, is after Pearl Harbor, everybody come together. And this country, no matter whether you're a Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, and all, do not underestimate our ability to coalesce and come back together and be as one. And that is something that is underestimated by the rest of the world. And external influences in the world that we live in can actually change the whole dynamic of what this poll would do. And then words, saying that you do this or do that in a poll that is not held specifically to the name of Craig Blair or John Doyle or whoever, then that's different. Okay, because you talk, everybody can talk a big game until it comes time to actually put your name on the line on that. And that, so there's a big difference in that mindset also. And there's one last thing, and this is the most important part of it, and that is understanding the history of the past. And many of us nowadays, of, including myself, do not have a full understanding of the his history of this world. And the better that we understand the past, the better we can manage the future. Mr. Carl. Well, it's certainly uh, the, the poll and the, you know, the results are concerning. <clears throat> but um, I'm, I'm still real confident, and I'm not, you know, uh, shaking and worrying really are facing the ultimate you know collapse that that's suggested and 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 part of that is that you know uh, during my life uh there's there's been important transitions that you know have been mentioned here but specifically um uh examples are uh uh, uh ronald reagan who i consider the greatest president of my lifetime started as a democrat and transitioned and be, you know became i think a great president a great a great world leader and uh, uh then more you know locally the trend when you know i started out and west virginia was controlled by uh more corrupt than liberal democrats and and it held our state back you know for for 
many years. I think the statistic was 80 in the earlier <laughs> session, uh, but but however long it was. But now, you know, we've seen great progress toward a more uh, reasonable, you know, appropriate uh, governmental approach, and and so that that gives me confidence that. Uh, yeah, and and I, I I think there you you can see uh, Republican progress uh, uh, around the country. Certainly, the Congress you know has come and gone some, but between 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 yeah, and I'm I'm nobody's been more critical of the the, the, the you know the minority of the majority in, in the House of Representatives, but that's another su- subject. But I th- I think I I'm it's a it's a concerned that there's enough people to, to trigger a poll result like that but it but long term uh, like uh, senator blair says it you know the, the the real trend is in the right direction now, may i ask craig sure. a question the, the, craig if the japanese had 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 the good sense to not attack us in 1941 do you think the country would have come together It wouldn't, did, not at that point. I don't know <clears throat> what the history would be afterwards, but at that point in time, no, we, no, we would have still been divided on whether we should have been. <clears throat> I'm losing the word right now for it. Uh, separatist or whatever. That, isolationist. Uh, isolationist. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the, I think that that would have prolonged further until another incident would have triggered us in. Suppose that. neither the Japanese nor Hitler uh, had had the stupidity to, to poke us. Is, is, God knows I, what, God I, I don't know the answer. Is, is yeah. the rest God, of your question, will we have let World War II unfold in Europe and, and let uh, Hitler yes, take over? Yes, that is the rest of, of my question. That's yes. Very possible. D- 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 that's an alternative history. Yeah, but I know. the thing about it is, is that we would not We would have stayed at each other and arguing back and yeah. forth with it until something triggered us okay. into action one way or another. Okay, and that in the triggers is what affects this world all the time. Mm-hmm. So, are you saying that we have to sit around and wait for somebody to attack us again? Well, let's hope not. Yeah, that's my no. no what, we, what we have to do is reject the isolationism that uh, triggered the you know drew the Japanese. Oh, I agree with and, that, and made made them mm-hmm. made them confident that they could blow us away. Well, I agree with that. I, I would yeah. I would like to say. The, the, the numbers that Joe gave, that, that's somewhere between 20 and 30 percent on both sides um, in, in these surveys that, that took these radical positions, are the radical right and the radical left mm-hmm. that we're seeing right now. And so I think we need to be – we need to push – that that centrist, um, mm-hmm. moderate type, re- moderate Republicans, what, what people would call rhinos nowadays, and moderate Democrats, um, and make sure that they're still the ones that are ruling, and that these twenty and thirty percent just stay on the fringes where they actually belong, yeah. and don't get elected. So you got to be really careful. You're not electing <laughs> these individuals, um, d- so that you don't see this radical yeah. stuff. And and John, you talked about the the 1860s, yeah, 1850s think, actually, 1850s, 1860s. Uh, I think that was a little bit different. That was so much geographical at the time. I don't see the same geographical dis- divide in in red states and blue states that we had back then. They're so intermingled right now. It's more like north northeast coast, west coast type, and then you have the the centrist. The, 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 the geography is, is more mixed. You have red areas and blue areas sure. of purple states. Uh, that that uh, uh, I'm talking about attitudinally. I think it's uh, it is very similar, and then last, and it affected our politics in a very negative way. I agree. Yeah. And last, um, I'm going to take an opportunity because Mike brought up um, Ronald Reagan, who I consider is one of the the probably top five presidents in our history. Uh, I know, John, you're not going to agree with that, but uh, I'm how do a, you know? A shameless plug. <laughs> I'm going to have it's a on shameless your face. plug it's on, your face. on Sunday. <laughs> My daughter had a a another child, my eighth grandchild, and and her name is Reagan, and it is spelled appropriately. <laughs> no, I think Ronald Reagan was a very good foreign policy president. I disagreed with a good bit of his domestic policy. Joe comes back to you for the final word. Well, I, with, with so many, uh, and when you talk about twenty, thirty, forty percent of the electorate uh, ready to 
to chuck some of our freedoms uh, in, in the name of, of uh, you know, the political leanings that they want the country to follow. Uh, I think it's important that our institutions hold firm, the court system, okay, which will judge whether or not a demonstration or free speech should be protected, uh, the court system, which will determine whether challenges to state certification of elections will hold up in the face of attorney generals and, and others uh, filing briefs and filing lawsuits to overturn those state elections. It, it, our institutions, and, and I'm not just to talk about the courts, but I'm talking about law enforcement, the FBI, the Justice Department. Yes, they have their flaws. But they are under attack. And if our institutions start to fall, if we start to disregard the, the decisions and the direction that these institutions take us, we are in trouble. So I think that is what we have to watch out for uh, as we go forward here with some of these prevailing attitudes. We have to still be able to turn to something, to the court system and other institutions, to keep ourselves within the guardrails that the Constitution set forth. And I think as long as we have that and the institutions hold, we'll be fine because we've, sat, we've, we've suffered and we have defeated challenges regarding the political wins in this country forever. But when you start, and if you have to watch for this, if some of these candidates for office start challenging the viability of institutions in the country, you have to be very wary of that because that's really – what's going to hold everything together. Joe, as always, good stuff as the leadoff hitter. We take our uh, top of the hour break until Senate President Craig Blair, you're on the clock with the first discussion of the 9 o'clock hour. This in studio with our Friday Five, including Delegate Michael Height. Welcome back, sir. Good morning. Senior member of our community, Mr. Michael Carl. Good morning. Senate President Craig Blair. Good morning. Former Delegate John Doyle. Good morning. And via telephone, Joseph Jowie Toots for ready. Joseph. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Issue number two, and for that we go to Mr. Craig Blair. All right. Now, I didn't have as much time to prepare for no. this as what Joe did, and Joe did a lot of work in it. But Gordon Gee was in for the Rotary yesterday, and we all know the, uh, the concerns that we've got with higher education. And since John Doyle sat in here, and he was Mr. Higher Education when I was in the House of Delegates with him, and, and Shepard's going through a process also, I thought that it would be advantageous for us to have a discussion about that, of higher education, not just in the state of West Virginia, but in this country, how to be able to adapt to the changing world that's around us, and what the thoughts are of this group here on, on where we're moving forward, uh, because if we don't adapt, we will fail. I want to start with John Doyle once again because you did serve a bit on the Education Committee. Uh, yeah, I was on the Education Committee for four years, but I was on, on I chaired the Higher Education Subcommittee of the Finance Committee for for twelve years. So, uh, I I think it has been a mistake across the nation, and and Craig talked about it and mentioned it that that states have generally cut public support support for public higher education institutions with the idea that t students and their parents should pay more of the freight in the form of tuition. Uh, I think that was a mistake. What is an even greater mistake is that in West Virginia, we've cut it even more. Uh, the, the, uh, the, it's a much deeper cut uh, than is the average for the country. And, and I blame Democrats and Republicans for this uh, because it started about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're seeing the result of that now. Uh, I think it is, uh, it, it's a mistake, particularly to eliminate languages. Now, maybe we should change the languages we teach. Uh, but in terms of, of commerce, as commerce gets more and more international, I think people who are going to be in commerce, uh, it's going to behoove people to know uh, languages from other countries. Uh, and again, m maybe we don't need to know French so much, but certainly Chinese, uh, maybe Arabic. Uh, who knows about that? But it, it seems to me that there's too much emphasis on cutting things like this. Now, the, the answer is, I think, to put more money into higher education, I commend Senator Blair and the legislature for the new higher ed formula that was passed. 
we have to have some money put into it in order for it to work. And finally, I do think there's a particular problem at WVU. I think President Gee, when he came, had the idea that he could have a 40,000 student institution, and I think that was a pipe dream. And it's and those chickens have come home to roost, and I think that he should stand up and say, folks, I made a mistake. Okay. From a former legislator to a current legislator, Mr. Hyde. Well, I, I think part of the problem with these uh, institutions of higher education is that there is a reduced enrollment in, in these institutions, and but the institutions were expanding what they offered, and I think they they expanded out of control to a point where, you know, when you're offering puppeteering and and gender studies and and all kinds of things like that, that that really don't go to the core of higher education, um, that you, you're over. You're you're putting too much out there, and you're not educating um, kids where they need to be educated. And w- with the respect to to languages, I think when they went in and started cutting languages, they were looking at how many students do we have actually enrolled in these classes, and it, and if it's not a large number, why are we even offering? Why why am I paying for a professor and a whole department to to offer French? Like you said, if I have, you know, five students in my whole um, enrollment in, in French, it just doesn't make sense. And I think when when the legislature cut back, it was because we wanted these higher institutions to find efficiencies and, and stop expanding like they were. And I think Gordon Gee, to his credit, did take an internal look and said, we need to um, rein in our spending and and get control of this. This isn't the legislature's fault. This is our fault. We need to to find out where our efficiencies are and and char- start cutting. And to his credit, he did just that. So you know, I think they're on the right path. And and um, you know when your enrollment's down, um, you you don't do expansions. You have to find cuts, and and that's what they're doing right now. Mr. Carl, well as a uh uh, graduate of WVU back back in the day, uh, I I have been for a long time a big supporter of Gee's work, but uh, I agree with a lot of these points too. Part of it, and I don't know if any of the three of you know this, the percent of, of Pennsylvania residents that are enrolled at WVU. I mean, it used to be really high, and I don't know. Uh, part of that that I recognize because of the low tuition, but, but of, I think a lot of Maryland residents too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, but but uh, 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 when the underlying economy uh, of of the you know the source of your students, you know, which is not just West Virginia, but uh, you know, it's predominantly West Virginia, then you know it, it, you can't you can't have a, a program or you know a, a government program that that uh, anticipates far greater you know participation than the than the economy and the population supports and and that so uh i can't even remember the the enrollment level when i was there it was under 20,000 mm-hmm. i'm quite sure so to think about 40,000 is 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 sort of uh, unrealistic I'm looking at the uh, the pie chart for West Virginia students here, uh, Mike, and I think it says Pennsylvania is 14.7 percent, Maryland is 8.4 percent, Virginia is 8.5 percent. Those are the top three outside yeah. of West Virginia. Just about half, not quite, 47 percent of West Virginia students are from West Virginia. Okay, Mr. Ferretti. Well, I have long thought that <clears throat> there is a lot of bloat in uh, on college campuses to the point where tuition keeps rising and rising at rates far higher than than inflation and other measures, uh, and it's becoming unaffordable for a, a, a large group of folks in this country. And I always thought that there was a need here to, to get lean and mean at the university level. There's one uh, article that I read at the beginning of this year. Uh, the Wall Street Journal covered the fact that Stanford University, and we know how expensive Stanford is. It's almost 100000 with tuition, room, and board. Great university. Stanford University had more administrators and faculty than they had students. 
which is remarkable when you think about that. There's 15,000 administrators at Stanford University in a school that has 16,000 students. Now, what are these 15,000 administrators doing? Seriously. That they, it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio between them and students. I, you can't tell me that that university doesn't need to cut back on administrators. Now, I have no idea about WVU and how many administrators they have there, but I have to believe that at that level, there's going to be some where, places where they can cut instead of cutting curriculum. And I have to believe that from the president, uh, Gordon Gee, on down, there is an incentive to protect some of those folks and not furlough them. So I would hope that our legislature, which writes checks to WVU every year, would take a close look at the mix of administrators versus students and make sure that's in line along with a lot of other things they have to consider. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yeah, I want uh, Mike. The uh, the I believe the reason that we have uh, 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 the the reduction in enrollment that we have, or a large part of it, is the increase in tuition. The higher your tuition, the more pers prospective students you're going to chase away. Uh, and the interesting thing is, in most other states. Public institutions are not seeing drops in enrollment. They are in, in some. West Virginia's one. Pennsylvania's one. It's a serious drop in Pennsylvania. Uh, much of, in, in the case of both WVU and Shepard, uh, the enrollment from Maryland dropped considerably about a half a dozen years ago because Maryland cut its in-state tuition almost in half. And that was, up until then, Maryland's in-state tuition was just about equal to the out-of-state tuition in West Virginia, and particularly at Shepherd and WVU that are the closest ones of the four-year institutions. So Shepherd saw a precipitous drop in enrollment from Maryland when, when Maryland made that change. Uh, I, I personally think that, that public education should be public. And, and um, I'll, I'll mildly disagree with Joey on this. Uh, using Stanford as an example, it's a private institution. No state government is responsible for whatever Stanford does. That's between Stanford and its donors. So, uh, but, uh, and I, I think, I, I don't know of a public institution that has an imbalance like Stanford and Harvard and some of these big time private institutions have. But Joey, you're right. Right, you need to look at the administrators and see if you can't consolidate that way, and I think you can. I think that also one of the reasons for a drop in enrollment has to do with COVID. That, that COVID showed that you don't have to go to a brick and mortar college anymore to get a quality education. You can do a lot of that online. And the recent, over the past five or ten years, the recent push of um, students to say you can get a good job without going to college you can go to one of these trade schools and these trades pay top dollar as well so there isn't as much of a push for students to have to go to college they can find a good career without going to college and they can get a good college degree online now uh you, you would be right if that affected nationally but again in most states we've seen college enrollment in the last two or three years uh tick up again in fact shepherd has shown an increase in the la in each in the last two years not a big increase but an increase so that's uh, uh I, I do think that was a factor for a time but i also think you're now seeing people saying okay it's it's clear to go back again but is that increase equal to population growth increase well, uh, in the, I think it, it, it probably in many states tracks it, but in the case of Shepard, you know, you're seeing an increase in the number of, of West Virginians. And now, our area is growing in population as opposed to the whole rest of the state. So that's probably a factor, too. Yeah. And because of tuition increases, how many people from this area who normally would have went to WVU are saying, I'm going to stay closer to home and go to Shepherd? Therefore, you, sh you see the increases at Shepherd from those students who normally would have gone to Marshall or WVU and because that, of cost savings. You're right. And by that logic, I think Shepherd maybe would be making a mistake if it cuts the same language as WVU does. Maybe uh, if they keep them for a while, for a couple of years and see, maybe they'll get some of the students that would have studied those languages at WVU. Who knows? 
Excuse, excuse me. The uh, Wall Street Journal uh, back in February of this year did an article on why should it take four years to get a college degree. Uh, and I found this article because I was researching how did we inherit the four-year model for a college education. And they trace it back basically to the medieval ages that that's how long it took to complete all the classics. This isn't the model of education that we use any longer. Mm -hmm. So why do we still have the four-year requirement for a college degree? If you think of yourself going to college, did all the courses that you take necessarily help you complete the, what you needed to do to get a job in life? Did you, did you really need 120 credits in the various things that you completed to have the job that you have? How many, how many times have you heard someone say after they got their first or second job, how much did college help you? Really, honestly, none of the stuff I studied applies to the job that I have right now. Remember, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson believed that the purpose of education was to train people to be citizens. The education itself isn't to get a job. Uh, the it, it, it's it's so we have a country that functions. Right, that, but do you need yeah. 120 credits to pass that no, test? In fact, when I graduated, I was required to have 128, and I had 143 because uh, I took a whole bunch of electives that I wanted to take. Uh, but it's it's uh, uh, I I I do think that you're right. They could streamline, and in fact, a few years ago, Shepard did streamline, cut it from 128 to 120, uh, and I think a number of other institutions have done that. Uh, it, it's and and I, I again, I uh, the, the uh, I, I applaud the direction we're going in the sense of saying people taking junior and senior courses in high school that really would be the same thing as the as the uh, uh, as the survey courses in in the, the freshman year of college have them count because it's really the same thing we have had a whole lot of of uh, um, uh, what's the word i'm looking for of of uh, of, of of repeat uh, uh, a, a lot of stuff is being repeated that doesn't need to be mm -hmm. yeah. joe you were about to say yeah cuz i just did some quick research rob uh, for every professor who is employed at WVU, there are two administrators on staff. Wow. So administrators outnumber teaching personnel on a two-to-one ratio. Uh, again, the question is, do we need all these administrators? No. Final word goes back to you, Craig. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I brought this discussion up. And, and <laughs> the declining birth rate has not been discussed. And that is a problem of with that. And, and so when you're looking at industry, and I'm going to t tie back into West Virginia. We put money into education, but what we did, it, we did it at the expense of the job opportunities. We need to be able to have the job opportunities in this state so that the people we graduate, whether it be out of our universities, our CTCs, or our high schools, no matter what mechanism it is, that they have gainful employment with upward mobility in this state. And then what happens is that they stay here, have families, have children, refeed the system, and, you know, population growth isn't necessarily a problem here in Berkeley and Jefferson counties, but it is a problem in the rest of the state. And if you want to have a tax base in the states that, that you can actually put money in to education, and, and education is an infrastructure. But one of the favorite things I just heard here this morning, and I'm glad it was recognized, is, is that education isn't always just about a job. It's how to be a better citizen. And that parlays in right to what we were talking about earlier uh, on, on Joe's question. And that is, is that where you become pragmatic enough and educated enough that you're willing to listen to the other side's perspective. That is so important because you cannot make good decisions on a vacuum. John and I, for years, have disagreed on many things, but we've always been willing to hear each other. And if you're able to develop a win-win scenario that can actually benefit the people of West Virginia, we did that. But we never sat back and villainized each other and, and turned our backs to each other and said no. We're not going to talk about anything, no matter what the issue is. And that is where the real problem is coming from of, of, on the polarization. And social media has got more to do with that. i got to add one last thing on this. Uh, 
And that is is that Marshall, WVU, Shepard, uh, WVU State, excuse me, West Virginia State University. We're, we're doing, uh, we started out as combined labs. Now they're called co-located labs. And we're, what it is is that uh, WV, um, West Virginia State and WVU, they all got their different things that they specialize in. We're going to put those labs close to those schools. Then what will happen is is that it will be a feeder system for the students, for the lab technicians, to be able to utilize the universities as well as the labs to make it so that we can actually do a better job in this state for less and also have the employment so there's a partnership that is tongue and grooved. That is as good as giving money to a university when you actually tie the, to our, our resources together. And we need to do that for K-12 through education as well. We need to be able to make it so that our universities will be able to graduate teachers that can do a fantastic job of teaching our children. And on that note, we move on to issue number three with Michael Height. All right, I'm going to go to uh, federal here. The Republicans have finally come together to choose the speakers. My question is, was Mike Johnson, a relative unknown, the right choice? Start with you on the phone, Mr. Ferretti. Well, I wonder, uh, Mike, because uh, this is a guy who hasn't been in Congress very long. Uh, his background is as, as a lawyer, so there's a strike against him, right? And uh, I think that... Uh, the Republicans have to wonder, you know, I know that uh, fundraising and winning the swing districts coming up in the next election are critical for the Republicans. And I just wonder if this Mike Johnson is going to have the gravitas to pull that off, because uh, when you got somebody in that speakership, they have to be the top fundraiser. And they have to marshal the forces together to win these elections. That's what the speaker's job is primarily from a political party standpoint. And I just wonder if Mike Johnson is going to have the chops to do that. All right, Joe, thank you. Let's move on now to Mr. Carl. Well, I, I, I think that uh, that is uh, – I, I, I'm confident that Johnson w- w- has those capacities. And, and therefore, I mean, that's, you know – first proof of that is that he's, he got he got enough votes to but i think from what i've learned about him he he one thing you know he got he got his trump support but he also got you know support you know away from trump or not you know totally psycho trump and 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 and, 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 and that and, you know and that that so so i like that he 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 he, 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 he knows and this sort of throws over to my topic, one of mine. So I'm going to have a different one. But it, he knows that it's it's important uh, leadership style, and and understanding where people are coming from, and and being able to build a team, you know, in terms of of act, active support, and not just uh, uh, you know raising you know keen about a you know a narrow thing. And and getting people to work together, being a leader, uh, you know, a, a coach, uh, however you want to call it, is is critical. And I think he, he in, in, in indicates to me by by what little I've learned of him, or that I've tried to learn more, that he he has that leadership capacity. Mr. Doyle, um, and and this bleeds into one of my topics, which I had decided not to talk about. So I'll I'll, I'll just throw it in here now. Uh, I, there are, I think, something like 18 uh, Republican members of the U.S. House of Representatives that represent districts that Joe Biden carried in, in uh, 2020. Um, and at least a half a dozen of them may, had public statements that said, quote, I will not vote for a speaker who is an election denier. Now, I'm not going to get into good or bad about election denying. What I'm saying is that if they were going to end up voting for Mike Johnson, they shouldn't have made. Uh, that was a political mistake to make a statement like that ahead of time because it's an attack ad that writes itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so I think the net result of this 
is going to be that more some of those Republicans were going to lose anyway in 2024. I think this increases the number of Republicans in Biden-leaning districts that, that will lose for re-election in the general election of 2024. Mr. Blair. Oh... <laughs> that sounds like me at 320 when my alarm goes off. Yeah. <laughs> so there are many dynamics that's at play here. Of one is is that there are chaos caucuses of and whether it be of in the House of Representatives in the House of Delegates of in Jefferson County Commission. Of uh, there, there, there is this world today of uh, that there feels. And, and I left the West Virginia Senate out. Forgive me, uh, for the, <laughs> from, 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 from that standpoint. Of uh, that, that you, you, sometimes people do things just to cut their nose off to spite the face, and, and th- th- that makes no sense. You have got to be able to uh, not be reactionary, but be proactive instead of reactive on being able to know what you want to do. Another thing that has come about being is is that uh, everybody's becoming tribal. Uh, when I say tribal, they fail to, uh, to, again, to what I was talking about earlier, you got to be able to take time enough to socialize with your enemy or to, to people that have different uh, perspectives so that you can actually t- know what they're thinking and, and and either be working against them by knowing what they're thinking, but being able to socially trust each other and socialize enough with it. I don't think that that takes place down there. And then let's not forget, why did most marriages end in divorce? Most of the time it's got to do with money. Okay, money, money, money is always a d- d- driving factor on it. The root d- of all evil? D- well, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could say that. Uh, but but d- d- when they go from every six months to a year of d- d- doing the budget. Continuing resolution. D- d- the con- continuization of that. That causes problems that spreads way out. And I said this last night in the meeting, and I'll, I'm going to say it again so everybody can listen. The federal government ought to do what the state of West Virginia did. And that is, you can't go cutting government. But what you can do is have a flatline budget, control your spending. You control your spend, and your revenue growth will continue to come up. And when you have that, then you can address some of the debt. You can address some of the things that you need to be done. And it will force out where you are wasting money uh, at, and make it evident so that you can see that and it gives you a common cause to be able to work together and when you solve the, the the dollar factor on that then that will actually make it so that you will have leaders that will rise up to the occasion and you won't have to be settling because i feel like they settled in the House of Representatives, to, to be quite honest, on whoever could get the votes, because they were tired of embarrassing themselves. No question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Heide, comes back to you. Well, I, I have some concerns. I think McCarthy got ousted because he wasn't a very strong leader. And um, when, you know, you ask some of these Republicans why they voted for Mike Johnson, their their answer was, well, you know, he's he's pretty boring. And I didn't have a reason not to vote for him. With all the other candidates, I had a reason not to vote for them. So when he came up, I was like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a reason why not. I shouldn't vote for him. So I voted for him. And next thing you know, he's speaker. So my concern is, is he going to have the chops to be speaker, which means you have to be able to rule with an iron fist, which McCarthy couldn't do. And I will give Pelosi credit for this. Once Pelosi became credit, she ruled the house there was there was no question even she, she even got the squad under control um and and i just don't see that on the republican side i'm hoping this guy has the chops but i'm not seeing it yet so um in, and these continuing resolutions i hope they get a handle on them and pass it not for 90 days or whatever but pass it for the the whole the whole year all right we come back mr doyle you are on the clock normally when i do that during this friday show i ask joe to say something about the law firm but then all of a sudden information became available to me that i couldn't pass on and that was john doyle's claim that he can sing a certain song in latin what song is this you know, I, I, in high school i learned to sing my country tis of thee in latin 
te cano patria candida libera te referet portus ed exulum et tumulus senum libera montium vox resonet <laughs> You didn't need to stand up. That's not the national anthem. Here, here's, here's the it's thing. It's just a really nice song. None of us would know if you were bluffing your way through that at all. <laughs> Randall Reed will. Uh, I'm going to give this clip to Randall Reed. <laughs> that, that could have been anything as far as we know. Yeah. Issue number four it goes to John Doyle. Um, since the Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives have ended their work stoppage, uh, and it looks like the United Auto Workers are about to end theirs. Uh, those are the signals we're getting. Uh, that leaves, too, the uh, television and movie actors and the Jefferson County Commission. So which of the two will end their work stoppage first? And I will, I will confess, I have been very hesitant to bring this topic up, the Jefferson County Commission, I, I really don't care about the, you know, the, the, the TV and movie actors. I don't, I don't watch that many movies, even the ones on TV. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry for people who like to watch them and, and are waiting for the new ones and all that. But uh, at any rate, um, I, of course, uh, in last year, lost to Jennifer Krause in my race for the Jefferson County Commission. She won fair and square. I have no complaints about that. But I do think it's gotten to the point where even I can legitimately say I have a complaint about her not showing up for work. And the same way with Trisha Jackson. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the legal beagles on the show on this. It is, it is my understanding that, that in law that the term malfeasance means you're doing your job, but you're doing it improperly. Misfeasance means you're not doing your job. So with that in mind, I think these two are guilty of misfeasance. And here is the, the practical tragedy of this. The reason it appears that the reason they want to, don't want to show up for work is that they want to make sure that this open spot on the five-member county commission is filled by someone they want, not someone the other two people on the commission want. Well, it seems to me that they could do the same thing they're doing on that issue by showing up for work and taking care of the rest of the business of the county and still just standing there united and saying to the other two, no, we're not going to accept the person you want. So I throw that out to uh, uh, the panel for their observations. As I understand it, if they did show up and it was a 2-2 vote, then it becomes at this point a, a method of striking candidates Right. Yeah, uh, that would then be put in place, and then it becomes an issue of Commissioner Tab as the most tenured would strike one, and then mm-hmm. it becomes a battle between who has more tenure, uh, Jackson or Stolifer. And since they're tied, it then has to go to some other tie-breaking method that I'm not aware of, and becomes even further convoluted in the law. So them just showing up for work doesn't entirely solve that issue. Yeah, it does because ultimately they all got to agree on a nominee. Even after all that rigmarole, and there's a whole lot of rigmarole that I think shouldn't be there mm-hmm. uh, in, in terms of, of solving a problem like this, ultimately it has to be a vote of the commission, as I understand it, yes, even sir. after all this stuff is done. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. You go first. Well, the, the tried and true way to remedy a situation where people don't show up for work is West Virginia Code 6-6-7 which involves the mechanism for removing county elected officials who don't want to come to work, who are, who are, are guilty of misfeasance or malfeasance. Uh, and, and characterize it any way you want to in terms of the statutory language. Not showing up for work, I think, is a fireable offense. So I think under the statute it takes either an act of the county commission, which we know won't happen, or it takes the prosecuting attorney for Jefferson County or it takes a petition signed by a requisite number of citizens in the county to remove an elected official who does not come to work. That statutory remedy has been employed elsewhere throughout West Virginia against sheriffs, against county commissioners, and others. 
who are guilty of misfeasance, malfeasance, or any of the other number of, of uh, uh, acts which are covered by the statute. So I think at this point it's becoming absurd and uh, perhaps a drastic remedy has to be considered. Also on the legal staff of this program, Mr. Michael Carl. Well, I, I agree with the, John's definitions of malfeasance and misfeasance, but uh, since our firm represents the county on several things, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to defer any minute comment. <laughs> Jefferson County? Yeah, yeah. I, they like the, the Rockwell case and stuff like that. Well, I got gotcha. you. Mr. Blair. <laughs> yeah, they know how to get out of things. <laughs> They, they're, they're always they're always citing that uh, attorney client privilege. Uh, Recuse, not, not me. I strap on my hip waders and go full in. We've um, noticed. Uh, well, first of all, I think that we need to go back and statutorily take a look at the process itself on dealing with the replacement of commissioners or whatever else it may be, uh, so that we've got a, a, a predictable process that when you have and, and to expedite it too. Uh, so that you don't, we've got people down there that families are going through probate and nothing is happening. Right. That is unacceptable. When you're elected to do a job, you go do the job. You don't always get what you want. For God's sake, I've wanted the eyeglass piece of legislation so that our seniors can actually get a prescription for their glasses that lasts longer than a year. Okay, and it didn't pass this year. Uh, but 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 what well, I'm getting, I, I'm complaining about it. But I'm still going to work and doing the job to be able to keep moving West Virginia forward. That should be happening in Jefferson County, uh, and, and I'm disappointed with that. But I can go back. Uh, what was it about 20 years when we had a commissioner in Berkeley County that wasn't showing up to to to, uh, to do the job for whatever reason it may have been that needs to be addressed in statute. And I think you're going to see, because of what's going on in Jefferson County, that we're going to go back. That won't solve this problem, but it will solve them into the future so that there is a predictability and repercussions if you do not show up to do your job that you were elected to do, no matter how hard it is. Now, I have one last thing, too, and that comes back to where I think I used the word chaos caucus earlier. And I think that you've got what you, uh, uh, there's a group out here that b believes in scorched earth policy. If it is not 100% my way, 100% mm -hmm. of the time and everything, then I am going to do everything I can to throw up every roadblock on everything, on anything that takes place. And the voters need to become aware of who those people are. And, and all because that's the, not the way it works in our marriages, in our families, in anything that we live in our life. And you cannot have that type of behavior in government. And, and uh, you guys made a comment a while ago that I sounded like a moderate. Craig Blair is no That was one. off mic. We would not have said that on mic. No, no, that's okay. I, I'll be damned if I'm a moderate. The matter is that I'm a far right. And there's lots of things I'd like to do, but I also understand that you can incrementally get to where you need to be uh, because the voters in West Virginia do not accept wholesale change at one time either. It, it's a migration. So you got to learn to be able to manage your government in a migratory fashion as well. Mr. Height. So I'm going to disagree slightly with Craig that I, I don't think we need to add. He's a moderate? <laughs> 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 no, he's not. Um, I don't think we need to add legislation. I think there are mechanisms in place on how to to uh, to choose the next uh, person for the county commissioner over there. I think what what the holdup is is you have these two individuals that refuse to go in and and allow that to play out. And and we also have a mechanism, whether it's malfeasance or misfeasance or uh, or what I thought was in code dereliction of duty. Um, there is that that proviso in there where Matt Harvey, the prosecuting attorney, can go in and, and remove these two individuals for malfeasance, misfeasance, dereliction, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Remove these two individuals and have two more appointed to to take their positions so that you don't have this issue anymore. 
So, so, so let me jump back at that for just a second. And that is is that I'm, it may be perfect the way it is. I'm saying it's time for us to go back and re-look at it. Okay. Uh, and, and, to, and if the House and the Senate and the governor doesn't agree, then nothing happens anyhow. But we need to go back and explore because it probably has not been changed in 50, 60, 70, or years or longer. And the world around us has changed. So let's go back and put eyes on it because we have an awareness now of what's going on. It may stay the same. I, I, I don't know that. But I do know that it was a heavy lift back when I think it was Commissioner John Wright mm-hmm. wasn't showing up. Of that, it, it was He was of, quite ill. Yes. And yeah. it was a heavy lift of to be able to manage it. That, that's when the commission was made up of three. to three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, we need to get a final. Uh, John, you want a quick word because we have, still have Mike's final issue yeah, to yeah, go. I, I wanted to close this up. Uh, I, I agree with Craig Blair. Uh, and I'm glad to hear him say that. Stop. That it needs to be looked at. <laughs> oh, okay, so. <laughs> Craig Blair's an idiot, but this does need to be looked at. Is that better? Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I can sometimes be quick on the uptake. Uh, and, yeah, the problem, Mike, with the system is it, it takes forever. Uh, I remember about 20 years ago, Jefferson County had a sheriff that people wanted out. And by the time that it took over a year to get this process done, and his term had come to an end and he was out of office, uh, the, it, it, the, the prosecutor can't remove the person. If the prosecutor starts it first, the prosecutor has to go to uh, the chief judge of the circuit. If the chief judge of the circuit thinks there's a problem, the chief judge of the circuit goes to the state Supreme Court. If the state Supreme Court thinks there's a problem, then the chief justice of the state Supreme Court appoints a three-judge panel, three circuit judges, only one of whom can be from the circuit that covers the county. And then they they meet and go through with it. It takes months to do this. So I do think, Craig, that the idea of figuring out a way uh, to to approach this a bit more expeditiously is a good idea. All right, final issue of the day, Michael Carl. Go back to the international level. What will it take for President Biden to order full-scale U.S. military on-the-scene uh, involvement in the Hamas uh, attack. Seems like it's getting closer by the day, Mike Height. Uh, well, somebody's going to have to tell him there's a war first. Um, <laughs> and then somebody's going to have to tell him to do it. So, I mean, that's what it would take realistically. Um, he's clueless, so I don't think <laughs> that will ever happen. Um, he's going he's gonna to take the 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 peaceful way out, I'll say, and and try to minimize as much conflict uh, or or U.S. involvement as possible. So I don't I don't see him ever giving the the nod for full U.S. involvement, Mr. Ferretti. Well, uh, that would take an act of Congress, of course, too. But uh, we are dangerously close because Iranian surrogates are attacking our military outposts. In, in Iraq, and we are firing back at them already. So it's getting dicey and concerning. Uh, I hope that Iran will just stay put and not become more involved. We know they work through Hezbollah in Lebanon, and that's, that's a real area of concern now. Uh, but it's not going to take much more uh, until we are starting to uh, fly airplanes over that area and uh, I'm very concerned about that. Mr. Doyle. How in the world can you say that a president who sent two aircraft carrier groups to the region and, and who has already ordered our soldiers to start firing uh, is, is, is going to be backing off? I think the reason we will not have boots on the ground in Gaza is the Israelis do not want us to. They got plenty of troops to get the job done. And, and it's all going to work better politically if they do it without our aid. Mr. Blair. I think we're on the world, uh, the verge of World War III. Uh, when you take a look at China, Taiwan, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the Middle East, uh, and then you pay any attention at all to biblical principles, we are very, very close to seeing the second coming of Christ. And uh, the, I, I know that that's... Some good. Book of Revelation that's, stuff there, man. Yes. I mean, it's... If you pay attention to these things, you can you can see this taking place. I I I, I'm praying not 
but I'm predicting that we're going to see major conflict uh, between the three here sooner than later. I have a question. If it is the end of days, does that 10% tax cut still kick in, or does that get delayed? Okay. Nobody's going to be giving a damn about their tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Carl, the, the, uh, uh, an act of or Congress does not need to declare war for us to actively protect ourselves, and Biden's re- per- clearly perceived l- reluctance to do it is what has fed Hamas's aggressiveness. David Valente, an appearance earlier this week on the program, made the point uh, that who's the beso- behind-the-scenes puppeteer here that stands to gain the most in dividing the United States' attention? The answer is, Russia. is Russia. Russia. Do, you, do you believe that there's some Russian involvement in stirring up this Middle East thing? Oh, I, I, I believe anything about the malevolence of Russia and Putin. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's fine for him to... Uh, for Biden to include, you know, the Ukraine issue as part of Tied the funding. Yeah, but well, but 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 to be aggressive and continue to support active involvement there as well at, at the level we had, or even more. But but uh, I I I I think he's bringing it in just to sort of water down how aggressive he needs to be in Hamas. Uh, well, and, and ahead, real quick, ten the, seconds. The Russia thing it, it takes all the eyes off of and attention off of the Ukraine war. So I, I can see their involvement as well. Have you heard the Ukraine war mentioned in the last week? No, exactly. So if if, if Putin is behind it, mission accomplished. I don't I don't know how much involvement there would be, but uh, we Putin we're through about. Iran. Yeah, well, that's that's what David Valente's theory was. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's uh, studied the region extensively. Hey, final thoughts are next. Everybody gets eight seconds to make one final point before the music runs out and we go through the uh, network news break. Final Mommy thoughts brought to you by Wayne Clark and the Locust Hill Golf Course. Joe, go. Looks like Tyson Bajan's going to get his second start for the Bears. Great local story. John Doyle. Uh, the Diamondbacks win the series in six games. Greg Blair. <laughs> I wish I would have went to school to be a lawyer. That way, if I didn't want to discuss something. (laughs) (laughs) Mike Mike Carl, after after the most pathetic fourth quarter in history, the Mountaineer uh, season and the coach's job is on the line Saturday. Mike Height, two seconds. Shout out to my new baby girl, Reagan and Ferris. Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio. Dave Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you again in 70 short hours.